Thank you. We turn to our next item of business, which is topical questions, and our first question is from Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government <clears throat> when passengers will see improvements as a result of ScotRail's recent remedial plan. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, ScotRail is investing £18 million to deliver a remedial plan containing a range of commitments which are designed to deliver improvements over the course of the next year. The key commitments include completion of the current driver and conductor training programme in the, mid in the east of Scotland by the end of May 2019, which will allow more classic 385s, class 385s trains and high-speed trains to be operated. Recruitment of an additional 30 conductors made available to operate services by July 2019 and recruitment of an additional 55 drivers made available to operate services by May 2020. I expect to see ScotRail delivering sustained improvements through delivery of these contracted commitments. Uh, that needs to happen now for ScotRail to ensure customers see improved reliability, fewer cancellations and more seats on the most badly affected routes. Mike Rumbles. Well, since the start of the ScotRail franchise, we've had three improvement or remedial plans. Three years ago, the Scottish Government published an improvement plan with 249 action points. Last year, we had another improvement plan with its 20 measures for improving performance. And today, we have a remedial plan with another nine initiatives. Three plans in three years under two cabinet secretaries. And meanwhile, we've got more cancelled trains in the northeast. Trains starting their journeys from Haymarket when they should start from Waverley. Passengers are sick and tired of putting up with late trains, trains where you can't get a seat and the substandard service provided. So could the Transport Secretary explain why long-suffering passengers should have any faith in this third plan? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the uh, member is correct to say there have been previous improvement plans um, uh, which is somewhat different to the remedial plan which is set out here which is specifically to address issues. A remedial plan is specifically to address the issues relating to where ScotRail are in breach of the franchise agreement and to take very specific measures to address that breach in order to get out of breach. Uh, and that's what the uh, actions set out in the remedial plan are intended to do. Uh, the member will also recognise that one of the uh, issues that came from the uh, improvement plan uh, was the Donovan Review, uh, which set out a range of actions that ScotRail had to take forward in order to uh, improve its services and reliability across the network. Uh, the member uh, will also recall that the ORR uh, published an updated report on progress that ScotRail were making in taking those recommendations forward and highlighted that they were making good progress across a range of those recommendations, although there were still areas where further work had to be undertaken. Now, in some of the areas where work has been completed uh, under the Donovan Review, which is a wider improvement across the whole of rail network, we have saw improvements, particularly in the Strathclyde Electrics area. However, that doesn't address the concerns and issues that those who are experiencing disruption on the east of the country have experienced due to cancellations, largely due to uh, a lack of uh, trained uh, crew. And that's exactly one of the issues that will be addressed through this remedial plan in order to address that matter, given that ScotRail are now in breach of the contract as a result of uh, the levels of cancellations. So I do expect the remedial plan to address these issues and what they've set out in it will address these issues on the east of Scotland. Uh, but the wider Donovan Review work about improving network overall is making good progress, as was highlighted by the report from the ORR uh, late last year. My grumbles. Well, <clears throat> Minister, I represent people in the North East and their, their service has deteriorated and these plans haven't worked. So the remedial plan says the company's performance is unlikely, unlikely, to reach acceptable levels until May 2020. This is one month after the government can take action to terminate the contract. Will the government take action to terminate the contract if performance levels continue to be breached by April next year? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, officer, uh, the reason that the time frame is to May 2020 is because it takes around a year for the, uh, for the calculation of the figures to work through the system by the very nature of how these franchises operate. 
uh, franchises which I frankly no longer believe are fit for purpose uh, and serve the travelling public well. But by their very nature, uh, it takes a year for those figures to get out of the system. That's why the time frame is until May 2020 for them to be able to deliver that. Alongside that, it takes over a year to train, uh, train uh, drivers. What I can say to the member is that if, uh, uh, if uh, uh, ScotRail fail to uh, deliver on the commitment set out in the remedial plan, which is now part of the contract, so these are contracted commitments that ScotRail have now given as a result of the remedial plan, which is different from an improvement plan, then they will be in default of the franchise. And if they are in default of the franchise, we are then, at the end of this remedial plan, we are in a position where we can terminate the contract. So that power is there. That doesn't remove the ability to terminate the contract if there were defaults in other parts of it. Uh, but uh, the remedial plan now creates a contractual obligation on ScotRail to deliver on these improvements. And should they fail to do so, they will be in default of the franchise and the contract. And at that point, government can make a decision on whether it chooses to then terminate the contract. Jamie Green to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, like many members, but not all, I want this current franchise to succeed. But equally, we all have constituents who are bearing the brunt of these daily cancellations, delays, unreliability and severe overcrowding on carriages right across Scotland. This is and must be unacceptable to each and every one of us. But given that this plan will take some time to implement, and for example, that includes the recruitment and training of drivers, which is one of the key points in this plan, the reality is that commuters don't have 12 months to wait. They want to see improvements now. So what is in this plan, Cabinet Secretary, that fills you and should fill us with any confidence that passengers out there will start to see tangible improvements now, not in 12 months? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, as I said, they have to start delivering now in order to get out of breach of the contract uh, and where they stand at the present time. So, for example, uh, as we uh, see ScotRail completing its training of drivers and uh, conductors, uh, particularly in the east of Scotland, uh, that will start to provide them with the cohort of staff that they require in order to meet the demands on services at the present time. The recruitment of additional staff will also assist them in removing the need to be dependent upon rest day working, which again has been an issue of contention in the past, which will provide greater resilience within the network as well. And as we see more of the uh, Hitachi 385s, which are late, uh, it may not be into the summer now that Hitachi deliver all of those, but as we see more of those being delivered, we will then see increase in capacity on the network overall in terms of seats. We are seeing that feeding in at the present time, and that will continue to be the case as more of the Hitachi 385s are delivered. And alongside that, making sure that the crew for these new uh, trains when they come in are able to operate them on the routes that they are designated from. That will, as a result then, allow some of the diesel units which are being used on other routes at the present time that will repla be, replacing, that are re will be replaced by the Hitachi 385s, allows them to be cascaded into other routes to provide additional capacity there, including both in the east and the Fife, and also in the Borders route as well. Alongside that, once more of the high-speed trains uh, are introduced as well, that again will increase capacity on the network. Again, that's been delayed because of Wabtec's failure to deliver on it. However, no, they're not excuses. That's just a reality of where we are. But once the additional rolling stock is in place, it will provide substantial increase in the number of seats which are available at peak times on the busiest routes. And that's why it's important we continue to do everything we can to ensure that ScotRail, Network Rail, Labtech, Hitachi are all focused on delivering on their commitments so that passengers get the services that they deserve. And that's what I'm determined to make sure that they remain focused on doing and that we see the improvements happening sooner rather than later. Bruce Crawford, followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I can also thank the Cabinet Secretaries for the useful answers to the, the questions. But about half of my still in constituents, I'll be the first to say that the performance of Network Rail has simply not been good enough, a matter I've written to the Cabinet Secretary about. But what can the Cabinet Secretary do about Network Rail, whose signal failures in the Stirling area last week caused huge inconvenience for my constituents? Is there not time that Network Rail was devolved to the Scottish Parliament so that customers can be absolutely clear about accountability 
and responsibility and where it lies across the network. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sign officer, the member raises a, an important uh, point here. I've uh, said in this chamber before that we need to ensure that both parts of our rail network are operating effectively. That's ScotRail and the rolling stock provider and the services to passengers and Network Rail in the services that they provide in supporting infrastructure. Just last week we saw, for example, in Haymarket a repeated failure in a piece of infrastructure that caused massive inconvenience to travellers across the east of Scotland, which then rippled into the west of Scotland. A piece of infrastructure that had already failed earlier that week, failing yet again. Now that in itself just demonstrates the need to make sure that both the rolling stock service providers and our infrastructure providers are aligned. And the member may recall from previous questions in this chamber on this matter, the ORR have issued notice to Network Rail because of their failure to be able to deliver recovery properly where there have been system failures in the infrastructure side. We have saw quarters where the levels of cancellations and delays which have been caused by infrastructure have been greater than that of uh, ScotRails itself. However, at the end of the day, passengers want the services that they deserve and they want to be able to get access to train services as and when they require it. So both parts have to play their part in doing this. And I've uh, stated time and time again, we need to see the devolution of network rail to this parliament in order to make sure that we can ensure that the way in which it's been managed and it's aligned is reflective of the Scottish route to allow us to make sure that both parts are operating in an effective way rather than it being uh, decided upon in Luton by Network Rail and how it operates here in Scotland. In doing that, we can make sure we've got greater accountability over Network Rail and it also has got greater accountability to the communities, the businesses and the public in Scotland for the services which they are delivering. So both parts of the system have got an important role to play in addressing this particular issue. Colin Smith, be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. The remedial plan estimates that ScotRail's punctuality won't stop breaching until 2020, but there's no timescale for hitting the actual overall punctuality target. ScotRail are paid hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to meet. So does the Cabinet Secretary honestly believe that this franchise will ever meet the 92.5% punctuality target? A simple yes or no. And if the answer is yes, when? Uh, sign officer, the remedial plan is not intended in order to achieve that particular target. That's the role of the wider uh, Donovan Review. Uh, ScotRail's forecast for achieving the 92.5% is by the end of reporting period 13 in 2020, 2021. And they believe that they are on track in order to achieve that. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I uh, draw members' attention to my register of interest. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary give an indication of how long the Scottish Government will be accepting applications for the Local Rail Development Fund so that the benefits of our improved railway system can reach even more communities, such as Ellen in the north-east of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sign officer, I'm aware of the interest in Ellen and the, uh, the uh, Local Rail Development Fund was a £2 million fund, which was originally... Uh, issued in February 2018 to provide funding to allow communities to appraise and potentially bring forward proposals aimed at tackling local rail connectivity issues. Uh, there were 10 organisations that were successful in securing some uh, point, uh, uh, £7 million from that particular fund. Uh, given the significance of the interest uh, that was reflected in the application process, uh, we reissued uh, another opportunity for communities to bid for the remaining £1.3 million on the 28th of February this year. I would encourage all members who have an interest within their constituency or within their regions that those who are seeking to apply uh, to this fund is information is available on Transport Scotland's website uh, and applications should be completed and returned by the 28th of June this year. Thank you. Question number two, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent BBC investigation, what action it is taking regarding its dealings with natural retreats and the Cairngorm Mountain Limited. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, President officer, this is an extremely disappointing situation and it's important that we understand what has happened with regard to public funds. Uh, I've asked Highlands Lines Enterprise, the Accountable Agency for Cairngorm, for a full account of the situation. I will be meeting with them to establish what more, if anything, can be done. 
Snow sports are an important part of our rural economy and through our enterprise agencies, we have committed six million pounds towards infrastructure projects since 2014. It's important now that we all work together to secure the future of Cairngorm to benefit the local community. Rhoda Grant. The Cairngorm mountain is crucial to the economy of Badenoch and Strass Bay, and the community there have been expressing concerns for some time about the management of the mountain by natural retreats and the flow of money in and out of the Cairngorm. As this is a complicated web involving a public body, its interaction with private companies, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what financial checks were made of both natural retreats and natural assets investments limited both before they gained the management contract and while it was running? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, Rhoda Grant is, is quite correct to say that this, uh, the, the success of, of Cairngorm Mountain is extremely important to the local economy in Badenoch and Strauss Bay and the wider Scottish uh, snow sports community. And she's also correct to say, I believe, that there have been concerns for some time amongst the local community. I'm well aware of uh, the nature of some of these, these concerns. Um, with regard to the questions that she asked, I can confirm that HIE did carry out due diligence financial checks for uh, natural, uh, uh, natural retreats. Uh, they reported that the NR turnover for the year end March 2013, prior to the procurement process, was 2.8 million. HIE was also assured by two forms of security, presiding officer, an intercompany guarantee and a personal guarantee from the main shareholder in the NR family. The second question, I think, related to the process after that occurred in relation to uh, various other changes, um, I can confirm that uh, appropriate checks were carried out at every stage and where appropriate professional advice was, I believe, sought. But I want to reassure Rhoda Grant and all other members, as I mentioned in my original answer, that uh, these are matters of concern to the public. There are matters of considerable public interest. I'm seeking a full accounting from HIE on these issues and full answers to the questions that have been raised uh, uh, by the media and by local community members and others. Rhoda Grant. Were Cairngorm Mountain Limited in breach of contract when they went into receivership? And if so, could Highlands and Islands Enterprise have cancelled the contract rather than had to pay the receiver to take it back into ownership? And given the community's desire to own the asset, will the Scottish Government now look at transferring it to them while ensuring that all monies owing to Highlands and Islands Enterprise and the Scottish Government are recouped from natural retreats? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if you forgive me for signing off, so that is specifically a legal question, and I think it would be imprudent for me to start to give off the cuff legal advice. I've already said that I'm seeking a full response on all issues, but could I just say this? That HIE was faced with the decision of ensuring that uh, they took action to enable skiing to continue, if of course the snow conditions uh, permitted, uh, and they took those obligations extremely seriously. They became aware that, that CML was in serious difficulty in October 2018 when a working capital loan of 1.8 million uh, was being sought, but the company was not able to provide security. The HIE staff then sought to progress a managed exit, and the aim, presiding officer, was not to end up in the courts, which could have prevented any operation at all on the hill. The aim was to continue to enable skiing and snow sports activity to continue if possible and if the conditions permitted on the hill. And that indeed was something that I think the vast majority of local residents were very keen to receive. So I'm not saying that a question is not appropriate, it is. It's a perfectly reasonable question. I will ensure, presiding officer, that that question, together with any others, which it would be imprudent for me uh, now to answer off the cuff, uh, will in due course be answered because we do take these matters extremely seriously. Uh, Edward Mountain to be followed by John Finney. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, given that it will probably take two years to get the funicular railway operational, and with the new snow factory probably in the wrong place, there is little to attract families to Cairngorm Mountain. Can the Cabinet Secretary please confirm what actual cash funds are committed 
from today to support the mountain over the next two years? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, I, 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 I was grateful that Rhoda Grant expressed her support for skiing the hill, and, and I hope Mr. Mountain has a similar view. Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't accept the, the sweeping judgments that he's made there as, as, as correct. Uh, and quite honestly, it's simply impossible to answer a question about how much money is required until we know the facts. The way to carry out government is first to, to assess the facts and then decide what conclusions are relevant therefrom. Now, that's important because, as, as, as uh, the member knows, that we are due very shortly to receive the peer-reviewed assessment of COWI COWI, the structural engineers, who have been examining, as their professional expertise enables them to do, the structural state of the Cairngorm funicular and also what steps are required to deal with it. Now, until we have established what their recommendations are, until that review is peer reviewed, it is by definition not possible to assess what action is required to remedy the defects in the funicular, far less make a budget. That is the task that we are engaging in. I'm very pleased, presiding officer, that there has been established by HIE and operated uh, a, 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 a body locally, uh, the Funicular Response Group, which is chaired by a local councillor and has uh, a substantial membership on it, which is liaising and working practically with the grain to find a solution to all these matters. So uh, my concern going forward is to find a solution working with all relevant parties, and that is what we will continue to do. John Finney. Uh, thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be reassured that all members wish to see a successful uh, tourist industry in the area. But Cabinet Secretary, you took grave exception to my description of the situation as a shambles last time. I wonder if in the interim period you have time to reflect on your judgment of that and whether you have undertaken any assessment into the reputational damage caused to Highlands and Islands Enterprise and sadly, perhaps wider uh, implications for Barnes and Trust Bay too. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I fully accept the situation is disappointing. Uh, I, actually, I would point to the fact that HIE intervened successfully to resume responsibility of running the hill. If they hadn't done that, there would be no chance of any operations on the hill. Uh, they should be given credit for doing that. They've set up a local response group that works sensibly, looking at the facts and dealing with the realities. And thirdly, and Mr. Finney didn't mention this, although I do appreciate his support for, I believe, I, I think he expressed his support for the Hill anyway. Uh, and thirdly, HIE also uh, contributed to the procurement of snowmaking equipment uh, and those operating in snow sports in the various five outdoor resorts in Scotland, most of, most of them recognised that snowmaking equipment, presiding officer, has the potential to be game-changing because it can extend the season, enable snow cover to continue when snow is relatively thin on the hill, as it has been, sadly, this year. Uh, and therefore, HIE's action last October in procuring that equipment, action which they had been working on for some considerable time, is something, again, that I think locally is welcomed. So the priority now is not to seek a post-mortem, but rather to find a prognosis and a way ahead. And that, that is uh, where I shall be focusing my efforts whilst ensuring that answers to perfectly legitimate questions, uh, such as those raised by Mr. Finney and Ms. Grant uh, and any others, will be answered by HIE. Uh, and obviously, well, they will be answered by HIE. And obviously, and I'm due to meet them, I've uh, arranged to. Uh, 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 arrangements are in place to meet with relevant HIE officials uh, uh, in the course of the coming weeks in order to deal with all of these matters. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. We're going to move on shortly to the next item of business, which is a stage one debate on motion 16542 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. And I would invite all members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. <laughs>